Chapter 9 of Father and Son. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eugene Smith. Father and Son by Edmund Goss. Chapter 9. The result of my being admitted into the communion of saints was that, as soon as the nine days' wonder of the thing had passed by, my position became, if anything, more harassing and pressed than ever. It is true that freedom was permitted to me in certain directions. I was allowed to act a little more on my own responsibility, and was not so incessantly informed what the Lord's will might be in this matter and in that because it was now conceived that, in such dilemmas, I could command private intelligence of my own. But there was no relaxation of our rigid manner of life, and I think I now began, by comparing it with the habits of others, to perceive how very strict it was. The main difference in my lot as a communicant from that of a mere dweller in the tents of righteousness was that I was expected to respond with instant fervor to every appeal of conscience. When I did not do this, my position was almost worse than it had been before, because of the livelier nature of the responsibility which weighed upon me. My little faults of conduct, too, assumed shapes of terrible importance, since they proceeded from one so signally enlightened. My father was never tired of reminding me that, now that I was a professing Christian, I must remember, in everything I did, that I was an example to others. He used to draw dreadful pictures of supposititious little boys who were secretly watching me from afar, and whose whole career, in time and eternity, might be disastrously affected if I did not keep my lamp burning. The year which followed upon my baptism did not open very happily at the room. Considerable changes had now taken place in the community. My father's impressive services, a certain prestige in his preaching, the mere fact that so vigorous a person was at the head of affairs had induced a large increase in the attendance. By this time, if my memory does not fail me as to dates, we had left the dismal loft over the stables and had built ourselves a perfectly plain but commodious and well-arranged chapel in the center of the village. This greatly added to the prosperity of the meeting. Everything had combined to make our services popular and had attracted to us a new element of younger people. Numbers of youthful masons and carpenters, shop girls and domestic servants, found the room a pleasant trysting place, and were more or less superficially induced to accept salvation as it was offered to them in my father's searching addresses. My father was very shrewd in dealing with mere curiosity or idle motive, and sharply packed off any youths who simply came to make eyes at the girls, or any maids, whose only object was to display their new bonnet strings. But he was powerless against a temporary sincerity, the simulacrum of a true change of heart. I have often heard him say, of some young fellow who had attended our services with fervor for a little while, and then had turned cold and left us, and I thought that the Holy Ghost had wrought in him. Such disappointments grievously depress an evangelist, Religious bodies are liable to strange and unaccountable fluctuations. At the beginning of the third year since our arrival, the congregation seemed to be in a very prosperous state as regards attendance, conversions, and other outward signs of activity. Yet it was quite soon after this that my father began to be harassed by all sorts of troubles, and the spring of 1860 was a critical moment in the history of the community. Although he loved to take a very high tone about the saints, and involve them sometimes in a cloud of laudatory metaphysics, the truth was that they were nothing more than peasants of a somewhat primitive type, not well instructed in the rules of conduct, and liable to exactly the same weaknesses as invade the rural character in every country in latitude. That they were exhorted to behave as children of light, and that the majority of them sincerely desired to do credit to their high calling, could not prevent their being beset by the sins which had affected their forebears 
for generations past the addition of so many young persons of each sex to the communion led to an entirely new class of embarrassment now there arose endless difficulties about engagements about youthful brethren who went out walking with even more youthful sisters glancing over my father's notes i observed the ceaseless repetition of cases in which so-and-so is courting such an one followed by the melancholy record that he has deserted her in my father's stern language desertion would very often mean no more than that the amatory pair have blamelessly changed their minds but in some cases it meant more and worse than this it was a very great distress to him that sometimes the young men and women who showed the most lively interest in scripture and who had apparently accepted the way of salvation with the fullest intelligence were precisely those who seemed to struggle with least success against a temptation to unchastity he put this down to the concentrated malignity of satan who directed his most poisoned darts against the fairest of the flock in addition to these troubles there came recriminations mutual charges of drunkenness in private all sorts of petty jealousy and scandal there were frequent definite acts of backsliding on the part of members who had in consequence to be put away no one of these cases might be in itself extremely serious but when many of them came together they seemed to indicate that the church was in an unhealthy condition the particulars of many of these scandals were concealed from me but i was an adroit little pitcher and had cultivated the art of seeming to be interested in something else a book or a flower while my elders were talking confidentially as a rule while i would fain have acquired more details i was fairly well informed about the errors of the saints although i was often quaintly ignorant of the real nature of those errors not infrequently persons who had fallen into sin repented of it under my father's penetrating ministrations they were apt in their penance to use strange symbolic expressions i remember mrs pewings our washerwoman who had been accused of intemperance and had been suspended from communion reappearing with a face that shone with soap and sanctification and saying to me oh blessed child you're wondering to see old paywings here again and but he rolled away my mountain for once i was absolutely at a loss but she meant that the lord had removed the load of her sins and restored her to a state of grace it was in consequence of these backslidings which had become alarmingly frequent that early in 1860 my father determined on proclaiming a solemn fast he delivered one sunday what seemed to me an awe-inspiring address calling upon us all closely to examine our consciences and reminding us of the appalling fate of the church of laodicea he said that it was not enough to have made a satisfactory confession of faith nor even to have sealed that confession in baptism if we did not live up to our protestations salvation he told us must indeed precede holiness of life yet both are essential it was a dark and rainy winter morning when he made this terrible address which frightened the congregation extremely when the marrow was congealed within our bones and when the bowed heads before him and the faintly audible sobs of the women in the background told him that his lesson had gone home he pronounced the keeping of a day in the following week as a fast of contrition those of you who have to pursue your daily occupations will pursue them but sustained only by the bread of affliction and by the water of affliction his influence over these gentle peasant people was certainly remarkable for no effort was made to resist his exhortation it was his customary plan to stay a little while after the morning meeting was over and in a very affable fashion to shake hands with the saints but on this occasion he stalked forth without a word holding my hand tight until we had swept out into the street how the rest of the congregation kept this fast i do not know but it was a dreadful day for us i was awakened in the pitchy night to go off with my father to the room where a scanty gathering held a penitential prayer meeting 
we came home as dawn was breaking and in process of time sat down to breakfast which consisted at that dismal hour of slices of dry bread and a tumbler of cold water each during the morning i was not allowed to paint or write or withdraw to my study in the box room we sat in a state of depression not to be described in the breakfast room reading books of a devotional character with occasional wailing of some very doleful hymn our midday dinner came at last the meal was strictly confined as before to dry slices of the loaf and a tumbler of water the afternoon would have been spent as the morning was and so my father spent it but miss marks seeing my white cheeks and dark rings around my eyes besought leave to take me out for a walk this was permitted with a pledge that i should be given no species of refreshment although i told miss marks in the course of the walk that i was feeling so leer our devonshire phrase for hungry she dared not break her word our last meal was of the former character and the day ended by our traipsing through the wet to another prayer meeting whence i returned in a state bordering on collapse and was put to bed without further nourishment there was no great hardship in all this i dare say but it was certainly rigorous my father took pains to see that what he said about the bread and water of affliction was carried out in the bosom of his own family and by no one more unflinchingly than by himself my attitude to other people's souls when i was out of my father's sight was now a constant anxiety to me in our tattling world of small things he had extraordinary opportunities of learning how i behaved when i was away from home i did not realize this and i used to think his acquaintance with my deeds and words savored almost of wizardry he was accustomed to urge upon me the necessity of speaking for jesus in season and out of season and he so worked upon my feelings that i would start forth like saint teresa wild for the moors and martyrdom but any actual impact with persons marvellously cooled my zeal and i should hardly ever have spoken at all if it had not been for that unfortunate phrase out of season it really seemed that one must talk of nothing else since if an occasion was not in season it was out of season there was no alternative no close time for souls my father was very generous he used to magnify any little effort that i made with stammering tongue to sanctify a visit and people i now see were accustomed to give me a friendly lead in this direction so that they might please him by reporting that i had testified in the lord's service the whole thing however was artificial and was part of my father's restless inability to let well alone it was not in harshness or in ill nature that he worried me so much on the contrary it was all part of his too anxious love he was in a hurry to see me become a shining light everything that he had himself desired to be yet with none of his shortcomings it was about this time that he harrowed my whole soul into painful agitation by a phrase that he let fall without i believe attaching any particular importance to it at the time he was occupied as he so often was in polishing and burnishing my faith and he was led to speak of the day when i should ascend the pulpit to preach my first sermon oh if i may be there out of sight and hear the gospel message proclaimed from your lips then i shall say my poor work is done o oh, lord jesus receive my spirit i cannot express the dismay which this aspiration gave me the horror with which i anticipated such a nunc dimittis i felt like a small and solitary bird caught and hung out hopelessly and endlessly in a great glittering cage the clearness of the personal image affected me as all the texts and prayers and predictions had failed to do i saw myself imprisoned for ever in the religious system which had caught me and would whirl my helpless spirit as in the concentric wheels of my nightly vision i did not struggle against it because i believed that it was inevitable 
and that there was no other way of making peace with the terrible and ever watchful god who is a jealous god but i looked forward to my fate without zeal and without exhilaration and the fear of the lord altogether swallowed up and cancelled any notion of the love of him i should do myself an injustice however if, if i described my attitude to faith at this time as wanting in candour i did very earnestly desire to follow where my father led that passion for imitation which i have already discussed was strongly developed at this time and it induced me to repeat the language of pious books in godly ejaculations which greatly edified my grown-up companions and were so far as i can judge perfectly sincere i wished extremely to be good and holy and i had no doubt in my mind of the absolute infallibility of my father as a guide in heavenly things but i am perfectly sure that there never was a moment in which my heart truly responded with native ardour to the words which flowed so readily in such a stream of unction from my anointed lips i cannot recall anything but an intellectual surrender there was never joy in the act of resignation never the mystic's rapture at feeling his phantom self his threadbare soul suffused thrilled through robed again in glory by a fire which burns up everything personal and individual about him through thick and thin i clung to a hard nut of individuality deep down in my childish nature to the pressure from without i resigned everything else my thoughts my words my anticipations my assurances but there was something which i never resigned my innate and persistent self meek as i seemed and gently respondent i was always conscious of that innermost quality which i had learned to recognize in my earlier days in islington that existence of two in the depths who could speak to one another in inviolable secrecy this a natural man may discourse of and that very knowingly and give a kind of natural credit to it as to a history that may be true but firmly to believe that there is divine truth in all these things and to have a persuasion of it stronger than of the very thing we see with our eyes such an ascent as this is the peculiar work of the spirit of god and is certainly saving faith this passage is not to be found in the writings of any extravagant plymouth brother but in one of the most solid classics of the church in archbishop layton's commentary on the first epistle of peter i quote it because it defines more exactly than words of my own could hope to do the difference which already existed and in secrecy began forthwith to be more and more acutely accentuated between my father and myself he did indeed possess the saving faith which could move mountains of evidence and suffer no diminution under the action of failure or disappointment i on the other hand as i began to feel dimly then and see luminously now had only acquired the habit of giving what the archbishop means by a kind of natural credit to the doctrine so persistently impressed upon my conscience from its very nature this could not be but molten in the dews and exhaled in the sunshine of life and thought and experience my father by an indulgent act for the caprice of which i cannot wholly account presently let in a flood of imaginative light which was certainly hostile to my heavenly calling my instinctive interest in geography had has already been mentioned this was the one branch of knowledge in which i needed no instruction geographical information seeming to soak into the cells of my brain without an effort at the age of eleven i knew a great deal more of maps and of the mutual relation of localities all over the globe than most grown-up people do it was almost a mechanical acquirement i was now greatly taken with the geography of the west indies of every part of which i had made manuscript maps there was something powerfully attractive to my fancy in the great chain of the antilles lying on the sea like an open bracelet with its big jewels and little jewels strung on an invisible thread i liked to shut my eyes and see it all in a mental panorama 
stretched from the Cape San Antonio to the Serpent's Mouth. Several of these lovely islands, these emeralds and amethysts set on the Caribbean Sea, my father had known well in his youth, and I was importunate in questioning him about them. One day, as I multiplied inquiries, he rose in his impetuous way, and climbing to the top of a bookcase, brought down a thick volume and presented it to me. "'You'll find all about the Antilles there,' he said, and left me with Tom Kringle's log in my possession. The embargo laid upon every species of fiction by my mother's powerful scruple had never been raised, although she had been dead four years. As I have said in an earlier chapter, this was a point on which I believed that my father had never entirely agreed with her. He had, however, yielded to her prejudice, and no work of romance, no fictitious story, had ever come in my way. It is remarkable that among our books, which amounted to many hundreds, I had never discovered a single work of fiction until my father himself revealed the existence of Michael Scott's wild masterpiece. So little did I understand what was allowable in the way of literary invention that I began the story without a doubt that it was true, and I think it was my father himself who, in answer to an inquiry, explained to me that it was all made up. He advised me to read the descriptions of the sea and of the mountains of Jamaica, and skip the pages which gave imaginary adventures and conversations. But I did not take his counsel. These latter were the flower of the book to me. I had never read, never dreamed of anything like them and they filled my whole horizon with glory and with joy. I suppose that when my father was a younger man and less pietistic, he had read Tom Kringle's log with pleasure, because it recalled familiar scenes to him. Much was explained by the fact that the frontispiece of this edition was a delicate line engraving of Bluefields, the great lonely house in a garden of Jamaican allspice, where for eighteen months he had worked as a naturalist. He could not look at this print without recalling exquisite memories and airs that blew from a terrestrial paradise. But Michael Scott's noisy, amorous novel of adventure was an extraordinary book to put in the hands of a child who had never been allowed to glance at the mildest and most febrifugal storybook. It was like giving a glass of brandy neat to someone who had never been weaned from a milk diet. I have not read Tom Kringle's log from that day to this, and I think I should be unwilling now to break the charm of memory, which may be largely illusion. But I remember a great deal of the plot, and not a little of the language, and while I am sure it is enchantingly spirited, I am quite as sure that the persons it describes were far from being unspotted by the world. The scenes at night in the streets of Spanish town surpass not only my experience, but, thank goodness, my imagination. The nautical personages used, in their conversation, what is called a class of language. And there ran, if I am not mistaken, a glow and gust of life through the romance from beginning to end, which was nothing if it was not resolutely pagan. There were certain scenes and images in Tom Kringle's log, which made not merely a lasting impression upon my mind, but tinged my outlook upon life. The long adventures, fightings, and escapes, sudden storms without and mutinies within, drawn forth as they were, surely with great skill, upon the fiery blue of the boundless tropical ocean, produced on my inner mind a sort of glimmering hope, very vaguely felt at first, slowly developing, long stationary and faint, but always tending towards a belief that I should escape at last from the narrowness of the life we led at home, from this bondage to the law and the prophets. I must not define too clearly, nor endeavor too formally to insist on the blind movements of a childish mind. But of this I am quite sure, that the reading and rereading of Tom Kringle's log did more than anything else in this critical eleventh year of my life, to give fortitude to my individuality, which was in great danger, as I now see, 
of succumbing to the pressure my father brought to bear upon it from all sides my soul was shut up like fatima in a tower to which no external influences could come and it might really have been starved to death or have lost the power of recovery and rebound if my captor by some freak not yet perfectly accounted for had not gratuitously opened a little window in it and added a powerful telescope the daring chapters of michael scott's picaresque romance of the tropics were that telescope and that window in the spring of this year i began to walk about the village and even proceed for considerable distances into the country by myself and after reading tom kringle's log those expeditions were accompanied by a constant hope of meeting with some adventures i did not court events however except in fancy for i was very shy of real people and would break off some gallant dream of prowess on the high seas to bolt into a field and hide behind the hedge while a couple of laboring men went by sometimes however the wave of a great purpose would bear me on as when once but certainly at an earlier date than i have now reached hearing the dangers of a persistent drought much dwelt upon now i carried my small red watering pot full of water up to the top of the village and then all the way down petitor lane and discharged its contents in a cornfield, hoping by this act to improve the prospects of the harvest. A more eventful excursion must be described because of the moral impression it left indelibly upon me. I have described the sequestered and beautiful hamlet of Barton, to which I was so often taken visiting by Mary Grace Birmingham. At Barton there lived a couple who were objects of peculiar interest to me because of the rather odd fact that having come out of pure curiosity to see me baptized they had been then and there deeply convinced of their spiritual danger these were john brooks an irish quarryman and his wife anne brooks these people had not merely been hitherto unconverted but they had openly treated the brethren with anger and contempt they came indeed to my baptism to mock but they went away impressed next morning when mrs brooks was at the wash-tub as she told us hell opened at her feet and the devil came out holding a long scroll on which the list of her sins was written she was so much excited that the motion brought about a miscarriage and she was seriously ill meanwhile her husband who had been equally moved at the baptism was also converted and as soon as she was well enough they were baptized together and then broke bread with us the case of the Brookses was much talked about, and was attributed, in a distant sense, to me. That is to say, if I had not been an object of public curiosity, the Brookses might have remained in the bond of iniquity. I, therefore, took a very particular interest in them, and as I presently heard that they were extremely poor, I was filled with a fervent longing to minister to their necessities. Somebody had lately given me a present of money, and I begged little sums here and there until I reached the very considerable figure of seven shillings and sixpence. With these coins, safe in a little linen bag, I started one Sunday afternoon, without saying anything to anyone, and I arrived at the Brooks's cottage in Barton. John Brooks was a heavy, dirty man, with a pock-marked face and two left legs. His broad and red face carried small side-whiskers in the manner of that day, but was otherwise shaved. When I reached the cottage, husband and wife were at home, doing nothing at all in the approved Sunday style. I was received by them with some surprise, but I quickly explained my mission and produced my linen bag. To my disgust, all John Brooks said was, I know the Lord would provide. And after emptying my little bag into the palm of an enormous hand, he swept the contents into his trousers pocket and slapped his leg. He said not one single word of thanks or appreciation, and I was absolutely cut to the heart. I think that in the course of a long life I have never experienced a bitterer disappointment. The woman, who was quicker and more sensitive, doubtless saw my embarrassment, but the form of comfort which he chose was even more wounding to my pride. 
Never mind, little master, she said. You shall come and see me feed the pigs. But there is a limit to endurance, and with a sense of having been cruelly torn by the tooth of ingratitude, I fled from the threshold of the Brookses, never to return. At tea that afternoon I was very much downcast, and under cross-examination from Miss Marks, all my little story came out. My father, who had been floating away in a meditation, as he very often did, caught a word that interested him and descended to consciousness. I had to tell my tale over again, this time very sadly, and with a fear that I should be reprimanded. But on the contrary, both my father and Miss Marks were attentive and most sympathetic, and I was much comforted. "'We must remember they are the Lord's children,' said my father. "'Even the Lord can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear,' said Miss Marks, who was considerably ruffled. "'Alas, alas,' replied my father, waving his hand with a deprecating gesture. "'The dear child,' said Miss Marks, bristling with indignation and patting my hand across the tea-table. "'The Lord will reward your zealous loving care of his poor,' even if they have neither the grace nor the knowledge to thank you, said my father, and rested his brown eyes meltingly upon me. Brutes, said Miss Marks, thinking of John and Anne Brooks. Oh, no, no, replied my father, but hewers of wood and drawers of water. We must bear with the limited intelligence. All this was an emollient to my wounds, and I became consoled but the springs of benevolence were dried up within me, and to this day I have never entirely recovered from the shock of John Brooks's coarse leer and his, I know the Lord would provide. The infant plant of philanthropy was burned in my bosom as if by quicklime. In the course of the summer, a young schoolmaster called on my father to announce to him that he had just opened a day school for the sons of gentlemen in our vicinity, and he begged for the favor of a visit. My father returned his call. He lived in one of the small white villas, buried in laurels, which gave a discreet animation to our neighborhood. Mr. M. was frank and modest, deferential to my father's opinions, and yet capable of defending his own. His school and he produced an excellent impression, and in August I began to be one of his pupils. The school was very informal, it was held in the two principal dwelling-rooms on the ground floor of the villa, and I do not remember that Mr. M. had any help from an usher. There were perhaps twenty boys in the school at most, and often fewer. I made the excursion between home and school four times a day. If I walked fast, the transit might take five minutes, and as there were several objects of interest in the way, it might be spread over an hour. In fine weather, the going to and from school was very delightful, and small as the scope of it was, it could be varied almost indefinitely. I would sometimes meet with a schoolfellow proceeding in the same direction, and my father, observing us over the wall one morning, was amused to notice that I always progressed by dancing along the curbstone sideways, my face turned inwards and my arms beating against my legs, conversing loudly all the time. This was a case of pure heredity, for so he used to go to his school forty years before, along the streets of Poole. One day, when fortunately I was alone, I was accosted by an old gentleman, dressed as a dissenting minister. He was pleased with my replies, and he presently made it a habit to be taking his constitutional when I was likely to be on the high road. We became great friends, and he took me at last to his house a very modest place, where, to my great amazement, there hung in the dining-room two large portraits, one of a man, the other of a woman, in extravagant fancy dress. My old friend told me that the former was a picture of himself as he had appeared, long ago, in my unconverted days, on the stage. I was so ignorant as not to have the slightest conception of what was meant by the stage, and he explained to me that he had been an actor and a poet, before the Lord had opened his eyes to better things. I knew nothing about actors, but poets were already the objects of my veneration. My friend was the first poet I had ever seen. He was no less a person than James Sheridan Knowles, the famous author of Virginius and the Hunchback, 
who had become a Baptist minister in his old age. When, at home, I mentioned this acquaintance, it awakened no interest. I believe that my father had never heard or never noticed the name of one who had been by far the most eminent English playwright of that age. It was from Sheridan Knowles' lips that I first heard fall the name of Shakespeare. He was surprised, I fancy, to find me so curiously advanced in some branches of knowledge, and so utterly ignorant of others. He could hardly credit that the names Hamlet and Falstaff and Prospero meant nothing to a little boy who knew so much theology and geography as I did. Mr. Knoll suggested that I should ask my schoolmaster to read some of the plays of Shakespeare with the boys, and he proposed The Merchant of Venice as particularly well suited for this purpose. I repeated what my aged friend, Mr. Sheridan Knowles, must have been nearly eighty at that time, had said, and Mr. M. accepted the idea with promptitude. All my memories of this my earliest schoolmaster present him to me as intelligent, amiable, and quick, although I think not very soundly prepared for his profession. Accordingly, it was announced that the reading of Shakespeare would be one of our lessons, and on the following afternoon, we began The Merchant of Venice. It was one large volume, and it was handed about the class. I was permitted to read the part of Bassanio, and I set forth, with ecstatic pipe, how in Belmont is a lady richly left, and she is fair, and fairer than that word. Mr. M. must have had some fondness for the stage himself. His pleasure in the Shakespeare scenes was obvious, and nothing else that he taught me made so much impression on me as what he said about a proper emphasis in reading aloud. I was in the seventh heaven of delight, but alas, we had only reached the second act of the play when the readings mysteriously stopped. I never knew the cause, but I suspect that it was at my father's desire. He prided himself on never having read a page of Shakespeare, and on never having entered a theatre but once. I think I must have spoken at home about the readings, and that he must have given the schoolmaster a hint to return to the ordinary school curriculum. The fact that I was a believer, as it was our custom to call one who had been admitted to the arcana of our religion, and that therefore, in all commerce with unbelievers, it was my duty to be testifying for my Lord, in season and out of season. This prevented me from forming any intimate friendships at my first school. I shrank from the toilsome and embarrassing act of buttonholing a schoolfellow as he rushed out of class, and of pressing upon him the probably unintelligible question, Have you found Jesus? It was simpler to avoid him, to slip like a lizard through the laurels and emerge into solitude. The boys had a way of plunging out into the road in front of the school villa when afternoon school was over. It was a pleasant rural road lined with high hedges and shadowed by elm trees. Here, especially towards the summer twilight, they used to linger and play vague games, swooping and whirling in the declining sunshine. And I was glad to join these bat-like sports. But my company, though not avoided, was not greatly sought for. I think that something of my curious history was known, and that I was, not unkindly, but instinctively, avoided, as an animal of a different species, not allied to the herd. The conventionality of little boys is constant, the color of their traditions is uniform. At the same time, although I made no friends, I found no enemies. In class, except in my extraordinary aptitude for geography, which was looked upon as incomprehensible and almost uncanny, I was rather behind than in front of the others. I therefore awakened no jealousies, and intent on my own dreams, I think my little shadowy presence escaped the notice of most of my schoolfellows. By the side of the road I have mentioned between the school and my home, there was a large horse pond. A hedge folded around three sides of it, while ancient pollard elms bent over it, and checkered with their foliage in it the reflection of the sky. The roadside edge of this pond was my favorite station. It consisted of a hard clay which could be molded into fairly tenacious forms. Here I created a maritime empire, islands, a seaboard with harbors, lighthouses, fortifications. 
my geographical imitativeness had its full swing. Sometimes, while I was creating, a cart would be driven roughly into the pond, and a horse would drink deep of my ocean, his hooves trampling my archipelagos and shattering my ports with what was worse than a typhoon. But I immediately set to work, as soon as the cart was gone and the mud had settled, to tidy up my coastline again, and to scoop out anew my harbours. My pleasure in this sport was endless, and what I was able to see in my mind's eye was not the edge of a morass of mud, but a splendid line of coast and gulfs of the type of Tor Bay. I do not recollect a sharper double humiliation than when old Sam Lamble, the blacksmith who was one of the saints, being asked by my father whether he had met me, replied, Yes, I seed him up long making mud pies in the road. What a position for one who had been received into communion as an adult! What a blot on the scutcheon of a would-be Columbus! Mud pies, indeed! Yet I had an appreciator. One afternoon, as I was busy on my geographical operations, a good-looking middle-aged lady, with a soft pink cheek and a sparkling hazel eye, paused and asked me if my name was not what it was. I had seen her before, a stranger to our parts, with a voice without a trace in it of the Devonshire drawl. I knew, dimly, that she came sometimes to the meeting, that she was lodging at Upton with some friends of ours, who accepted paying guests in an old house that was simply a basket of roses. She was Miss Brightwen, and I now conversed with her for the first time. Her interest in my harbors and islands was marked. She did not smile. She asked questions about my peninsulas, which were intelligent and pertinent. I was even persuaded at last to leave my creations and to walk with her towards the village. I was pleased with her voice, her refinements, her dress, which was more delicate, and her manners, which were more easy than what I was accustomed to. We had some very pleasant conversation, and when we parted, I had the satisfaction of feeling that our intercourse had been both agreeable to me and instructive to her. I told her that I should be glad to tell her more on a future occasion. She thanked me very gravely, and then she laughed a little. I confess I did not see that there was anything to laugh at. We parted on warm terms of mutual esteem, but I little thought that this sympathetic, Quakerish lady was to become my mother. End of chapter 9